Leave George, he's fine. Uh, hello, I'm Thomas Crothers. I'm Will Legator. And uh, we this are. Is George and this is George. And I'm George Michael. Um, go to youtube.com, uh, Crothers Legator, and whoever to uh, find out what that means. Um, we're nearly concluded, Will, with our Assassin's series. Uh, no, that's bullshit. Our Sundive, our Sundive series. Um, we have this. We have passion. And then now we're not going to, but we could have done episodes on Bounce, Roadshow, that whole fiasco. Um, we are now this. We've been doing this particular series now for so long that the there is a new Sundown show, uh, <laughs> which um, will have a cast recording in April. And uh, depending on if we like it or not, maybe we'll hop on for half an hour and say if we like it. If we don't, you can take that as our um, opinion. Um, so, yeah, so you can look forward to that sometime in April, if, <laughs> as and if, it's good. January, February, March, April, May, June. No, this comes out before, This comes out after. Anyway. Um, so, yes, we're nearly, we're nearly done. Uh, Assassins is a show, Will, that you hadn't listened to, knew of, or am I no, no, you'd looked, you'd listened to it because you were maybe going to do it for the college. I can't remember. Yes, yeah, I, I know of it. Yeah. Because mm. it's the guy who runs the society, it's one of his favorite shows. Yes. Would you want to direct it or would you want to be in it or what? Um, I think he'd want to be in it. Oh, who do you think he'd be? Oh. Now, well, I mean, we can we can go straight on to this conversation. Um, I'm the perfect boof, you're the perfect Hinkley. Uh, also, or Guto, or Guto. I think you'd be a very good Charles Guto. Yeah, yeah, because I, I, my French accent, as we know, is brilliant. <laughs> yes, it is. They, I have listened to a load of recordings now. Zubon, Maurice Luc Lupet. Um, I've listened to a lot now. Can't find one where he has an actual French accent, so I don't know if he was. If it, uh, is he? Is he actually? He's not French, is he? Because he he just wants to be the ambassador to France. Yeah, that's what he wants to be, and then he ends up shooting a guy. <laughs> no, you're not. Don't be silly. <laughs> Mad that's as it. a hatter. Um. Yeah. I um. Well, I. One thing I do very much like about assassins. Is the majority of the roles are written for bass baritones, <laughs> um, and the gentleman we were discussing is like a probably a counter tenor, so he would have to be uh, Zangara. Zing uh, well, I, <laughs> I infamously play Zangara, and that has <laughs> uh, that has two incredibly high notes that I couldn't yeah. hit. Thankfully, I am being electrocuted, so I could just. <laughs> um, Charles Guteau was born in uh, the very French Illinois. No, so he was just um, four of six children to Jane and August and Luther Wilson Guteau. What a name. A great name. <laughs> uh, whose family was of French uh, Houjon ancestry. Uh, the Houjon, Houjonos, no idea, uh, a religious group of French uh, Protestants. So he was of French lineage 
and presumably that is where he got the um the inspiration to kill the president of the united states i guess let's start there i studied american theater with a very politically minded teacher and so we touched on a lot of assassinations and the like i'm also a jfk freak i love i am absolutely mad for the jfk assassination <laughs> um and i'm fascinated by uh booth and lincoln how many of these did you actually know of will prior to the musical assassins oh let's get the list of them so i knew of uh oh dear very good well very good <laughs> Okay, um, so John Wittsburg, yeah, but obviously, uh, Oswald, uh, yeah, that's it. I, I yeah. knew President Gerald Ford. President I knew all Gerald the presidents. Ford. Did you not know? Did you not know about John Hinckley Jr. and his obsession with Jodie Foster and that he killed, no? tried to kill Reagan? No. Yeah. Yeah, he's fascinating. Um, or is he fascinating? This is the constant question of the show. Is it fascinating? Are they interesting? Or is this problematic and dangerous? I don't want to say the word problematic, but you know what I mean. Because the big, th you know, people talk about this show being controversial. It was incredibly controversial when it first opened. The 2004 production that we watched was originally scheduled, Will, for 2001, uh, but was... Oh, I see. Uh, there is a plot in this where it, he wants to crash a plane. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i see i see why that was moved yeah and so they 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 bumped it for for oh, what was the official statement i have it here um the 2004 blah, 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 blah. maybe i don't have it here and that's the uh, that's the version with uh neil patrick harris the 2004 broadway yeah. Yeah. yes and uh I can't find it now. Uh, the, I mean, the long and short... Oh, yeah, sorry. Originally, can, yeah, I don't have the official statement. Uh, but, yes, that was... So this this is another thing I want to just slightly touch on, is that it opened originally off-Broadway at the same Playwrights Horizons place that we talked a lot about with Sunday in the Park with George, where you could develop the material, and then eventually it was put on for a series in 1991 in... Um, Playwrights Horizons off Broadway. So when it came to then, obviously, 15 years passes, the album becomes sort of famous in the Sondheim canon. And so when it came to the 2004 Broadway revival, technically, is it was it a revival or was it an original Broadway performance? Mm. Because normally... Is this coming to play at the Tonys? Uh, yes, this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, the... Yeah, it came, majorly came into play, and it was a big thing of, is it going to win? Is it not going to win? Um, so it was... So the, there's another ruling, apparently, when it comes to revival status, is whether or not it can be deemed a classic. Because when you think about it, a lot of these shows, like Sunday in the Park with George, for instance, was off-Broadway and then moved to Broadway within the same season. And so that doesn't become a question. It ran off Broadway. It it would be a bit alike. Hmm, I'm trying to think. Um, I don't Back to the Future. No, Back to the Future was always Broadway. No, no. Or West End. It was Manchester to start with. Ah so, yeah, 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 yeah. I see what you mean. Similar, similar concept. Yeah, similar concept. Oh, it would be like if it somewhere. Norwich. No, it was Manchester. It was Manchester, you're right. Yeah. It would be like if it started in Manchester and then wasn't put on for 15 years. Ah. Oh, so is it a revival? No, I would say no, it's not. I'd say it is new to the West End. And then it, the thing is, is that, and we do this every year with Oscars, you know, is is Viola Davis actually a supporting actor? But, you know, is that an actual supporting performance or is she in it for, is, is Lecter really best actor or is he best supporting? And, and, and all these sorts of conversations come largely down to... Um, where it has the best chance to win. Um, and it did win. And Joe Mantello won uh, for the best director as well. Oh, what it ended up in revival, if I remember rightly. Let me oh. just double check. Um, you can change the world. Hugh Jack. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Here we are. Hugh Jackman. <laughs> Hugh Jack yes, I heard you <laughs> perk up. Uh, 
It was 2000 and... Uh, oh, it was the year before then. Um, I believe Hugh Jackman hosted and won. Yes, so this was the boy from Oz year. Oh, 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 oh. when my baby! I, I, I think I think that year is coming up uh, soon as well. <laughs> yes, we're now in twenty twenty four. Well, well, no, don't cast assumptions. There was that rumor that he was trying to flirt with Sutton Foster. Um, so we have yes, he it was nominated eventually for best revival of a musical. And that is very good for its chances. And now I understand why they wanted it in Best Revival. What was it against? It was oh, up against it? Avenue Q and Wicked. Yep. For Revival? For, mus original? for Best Musical. This is 2004. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay, I, I see. Yeah, and Assassin's is never going to win. Wicked will win any day. You're wrong, Will. Avenue, Avenue Q, Q won. won. It, it comes down to, it's the same thing, isn't it? It always happens. Moonlight versus La La Land. Avenue Q versus Wicked. You know, it's always big movie, little movie. Cardboard box, I guess, yeah. yeah. Um, I believe that John Mantello also directed Wicked. He did, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is an incredible year to be to be Joe Mantello. Um, a great actor and a great director. Um, I'm trying to think what you would... Know. Did you ever watch The Boys in the Band, Will? It's a very, very good play. And then they made it into a Netflix film with every gay actor there is. No. It's very good. Anyway, he directed that. And he, di he directed the original uh, Broadway 9 to 5, Will. Um, ooh. Ooh. Uh, he, yeah, no, he's, he's, uh, and he directed Here We Are. So this is, he really is one of the great um, American directors of, um, of Sondheim. American. And yeah, he did direct uh, Wicked that same year. So that's an incredible year to be Joe Mantello. And um, like I said, uh, Hugh Jackman uh, not hosted and uh, won for best um, performance in a actor in a musical. And he was up against um, Alfred Molina in Fiddler on the Roof. Oh, wow. Oh, brilliant. That would be good. That's great. Uh, oh, how do you feel about this? So, Idina and Kristen were both nominated in lead. Yep. Who won? It should be Idina. It was Idina, yeah. It's Adele Dazi. Adele, the wickedly talented one and... Oh, well, no, I had to do... I did a musicals quiz on board the luxury liner that I used to work for. And... Like it got to a point where I was writing, you know, some pretty good questions, and then the person I was voting with, a lovely, a lovely woman, but she said, um, "Can we do some like easy questions for people?" And she wanted to do a question about Frozen, and so the question was, uh, you know, who voiced um, uh, Elsa in yeah. Frozen? And so I phrased it as, "Once famously." Referred to as Adele Dazim by John Travolta. <laughs> and I played this. Please welcome the wickedly talented one and only Adele Dazim. <laughs> and played it about <laughs> 10 times. Right. Um, Going back to Wicked, sorry. I'm sure, yeah, sorry, I'm sorry, sure I've definitely said this before, but it, um, I find it bizarre that neither Elphaba nor uh, the other one get their yeah. own bow. Yeah, well, they, yeah, yeah. They, they have to hold hands and bow simultaneously. Mm. Imagine, well, imagine being Elphaba and you never get your own bow. How do you feel about this bow? Because they all bow together. <laughs> Sorry, they let the five ensemble members take a yeah. bow. Thank you. Bye. And then <laughs> all nine assassins and the balladeer bow. Does that feel right to you? That feels no, right it, to it, me. It, oh, sorry, go on. <laughs> I, I think if, if you're going to make it, okay, we're doing an ensemble piece and it's an ensemble bow, everyone bows together. Ooh. I, oh, nice Because one. they're all players telling a story. Yeah. Which because is what we did when we played, when we did Sweeney Todd, and I'll <laughs> never forgive Harry. I played Anthony in Sweeney <laughs> Todd. I had 12 <laughs> songs and I didn't even get my own bow. I'd feel that that's how you'd feel if you were the balladeer in this. Because obviously, Booth 
and Guiteau are the ones that everyone's like, oh, I mean, you know, oh, I'd love to play Booth. Booth Michael Cerverus won the award. But in actuality, the balladeer has the most songs, is a tough role to sing, and um, I, I just think I think Neil Patrick Harris is sensational here. Mm. I really do. I, I, I mean, it's not a hot take to say that Neil Patrick Harris is very good, but I do think hmm, maybe this sounds stupid. I do think we forget sometimes how excellent he is. Oh, he's very good. He's one of our best. One of their one of their best. <laughs> <laughs> not one of ours. <laughs> Them. Um, Assassins, music and lyrics by uh, Stephen Sondheim, book by John Wideman. So prior to this, you knew that it was an ensemble piece and all of the Assassins got a song, or did you not even know that? Um, I, yeah, I, I I pretty much knew that it, it was a story of the American presidential assassins yeah. singing about their assassinations. Mm -hmm. um, so... In 1979, as a panellist at producer Stuart Ostro's Musical Theatre Lab, Sondheim saw a script by a man named Charles Gilbert Jr. entitled Assassins, and it was about a Vietnam veteran who became a presidential assassin. Fake, fake story, fictional story. And Sondheim liked the title, <laughs> and he liked the quotes from various historical figures, and also he liked the opening scene, which was set in a shooting gallery, and it had a lighted sign that said, shoot the prayers and win a prize. And he liked all of that. And so he said, he approached Charles Gilbert Jr. And he said, I'd like to make this into a musical. Um, and Charles Gilbert Jr. said, wow, that's incredible. Can I write the book? Can I work with you? And he said, no, I want to work again with John Wideman. So when you think, I've never thought about it this way, but in a sense, John Wideman is his historical and political um, co uh, writer. He did Pacific Overtures. And I believe, if I remember rightly, that was based off his own research into feudal China and Japan and Asia. So I think I, I think that John Wyburn's just an incredibly prolific historical uh, mind. Um, incredibly, Charles Gilbert Jr. was okay with that idea and mm -hmm. still let them have the idea, which I think, would you do that? Do, I think do, so. Has he, has he been credited? Does he get... So the credit Billy, is... Does he get money from it? <clears throat> the credit is... Blah, 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 blah. And then at the very bottom, Assassins is based on an idea by Charles Gilbert Jr. So he does get, you know, something. Obviously, we're far removed from what that original idea was. So um, let's talk a little bit about possible ideas, because another thing we were talking about, it was started off at Playwrights Horizons, um, where they can experiment a bit more. We were talking about the process of Sunday in the Park with George, where everybody got a song and then they're cursing songs and putting songs in. Originally, there was the idea of a kaleidoscope of assassins. So they would have Gafrilo Princip, who killed Franz Ferdinand, possibly, uh, James O'Reilly, who killed Martin Luther King, Brutus killing Caesar. Mm. Then they thought it's too broad. And so they decided to just do Americans. And that was in, originally going to include uh, Dan White, who killed Harvey Milk. And then they had... Who <laughs> killed Sean Penn, yeah. <laughs> and, then, um, and then... But then the question immediately arose of, okay, when do we stop? Do we do Mark Chapman? Does Mark Chapman get a song? Does Saran Saran get a song? And then they came up with the streamlined idea of the attempted and successful assassins of the presidents of the United States, which gives them, well, they cut, they actually do did cut a couple. There was a man named John Schrank who shot at Teddy Roosevelt and John Weidman did write a scene. Um, and that was based on allegedly he had a dream where William McKinley uh, came to him and told him to kill Teddy Roosevelt. I mean, like, you know, they're you all do. nutters, aren't they? They're all nutters. Well, this is this is the great thing, because the this is where I think Assassin still has a power and has a controversy and has an effect. Because I mean, we did it ourselves. We did a, a sort of par parody thing about Hitler. This show isn't really making jokes about it's not making a f i mean it, it makes a full sort of of sarah jane moore and squeaky from and that sort of but there is something incredibly provocative provocative about giving booth a violent racist one of the most 
beautiful ballads Sondheim's ever written for a man and to have it structured so that, I mean, we'll talk about it in Ballad of Booth, but like it's structured so beautifully in that he tells the argument of the war and you kind of understand where he's coming from. You know, if I kill this one man, then the war will stop and everything, there'll be no more bloodshed and thousands of people will be saved. I can see that point of view. And then at the very high note of the song, throws in the N-word to remind him that actually he was a, he was an incredible racist. And that was also fueled by his hatred. You turned your spy into civil war. Um, and, well, no, he's saying that about Lincoln, sorry. And then, and then even Bick, you know, funny monologue to start. Second one, a lot darker. And... Do you feel the unevenness on the um, Assassins Who Aren't Given a Song? You know, d obviously we are Sondheim people more than we're John Wideman fans of his, you know, work. <laughs> are we unnaturally, unnaturally biased? Are we biased as an audience to put more onus on, ba on Booth and Gateau rather than Bick, who sure leads another national anthem but only gets his monologues. I, I, I think it works the way it does mm. um, as a cohesive piece. So you felt it was cohesive and worked for you? I did. Me too. I like... I, you know, sorry, no, I was no, waiting for you to... <laughs> <laughs> no, I oh, love Assassin's. Really? You, you thought... Mm, interesting. Mm. <laughs> this, I, I think for the this, this production especially really does a wonderful job at blending and seamlessly moving in and out. Yeah. And the, I mean, it was, it's, it was never written with an interval, but like it just moves through an hour and 40. It, and it's, it's, it's very streamlined really when you, to, it's kind of, you can, you can imagine this being the sort of first act of Sunday argument in mm. the, I, I, cause well now actually, I don't know what a second act sort of deconstruction on top of this first act would be. Um, Sondheim said that he expected backlash from the public due to the content. There are always people who think that certain subjects are not right for musicals. We're not going to apologise for dealing with such a volatile subject. Nowadays, virtually everything goes. And that's what he said to the New York Times. It was presented with a workshop reading. Listen to this cast. Christine Baranski as Sarah Jane Moore. Nathan Lane as Samuel Bick. Anthony Heald, who you'll know better as... Um, the the man who runs the asylum in Silence of the Lambs as Leon Cholgash, <laughs> Green Mile Mouse Man Michael Jeter as Zangara, and Swoozy Gers as Rome, and Kevin Anderson, original um, Joe Gillis from Sunset Boulevard, or as you'll know better, Will, the nice guy from Sleeping with the Enemy as the Balladeer, <laughs> as the Balladeer and Oswald. Now, I don't want to be rude, but I didn't know that Anthony Heald could sing or Michael Jeter. So I'm not exactly sure whether that was more a workshop reading of the play and that sort of thing. But I could be completely wrong, and I don't want to cast aspersions. Um, Let's talk... Now, we're focusing today on the 2004 Broadway revival because it's the one that has the production shot of it. Well, the camera, you know, and, and we got a, the best impression of that. But let's talk a little bit first about that original production. It was in 1990 and closed. Um, it, it opened on December the 18th, 1990 and closed February the 16th, 1991 after 73 performances. Um, and it was, you know, supposed to move to Broadway and just never got the budget for it. And it had Victor Garber, the wonderful Victor Garber. And originally, it was just commissioned as a piano, bass, and drum. Then Michael Sterabaum was commissioned uh, to do the orchestrations. And Jerry J Jerry Zachs, the director and producer, said that, um, no, it has to be big because it's Sondheim. And so Sterabaum asked Playwrights Horizons what his limitations were, and Zach said, none. The original <laughs> production had 36 musicians. <laughs> And it had this incredible rotating stage on a sort of carousel that mm. worked very, very, very well. And they used a lot of projections, um, including... He was, oh, he was in his projection era, wasn't he, Sunday? <laughs> what am I trying to think of? Was, he not, was George the same time? Was it earlier? A lot earlier. George was earlier. George was 84. Mm. Um, 
but the project the big the big like thing with the projection is that Lee shoots JFK and then straight away projection <clears throat> the Lee Harvey Oswald getting shot live on air by Jack Ruby. <laughs> and so you've got that projected behind them for all of everybody's got the right to be everybody's got the right to be happy, which adds another little dark element to it. Um whereas this production that we watched 2004 is kind of revelatory, sort of bombastic, mm. underpinned with a tragic score, but it is this incredible flash moment and, and projects really what that moment in history was. Also, the biggest difference is that this original production did not have Something Just Broke. Oh. That was added later, which we'll talk about soon. Um, shall we jump into Assassins, well? Shall we? Shall we? Um only 10 songs, if you count the reprise of Everybody's Got the Right to Be Happy and split gun song yeah, in the Battle of the Children. Yeah. Do you think... I don't think it needs more So I mean, I would never say no. Do you think there is a world where Assassins is, you know, a more beloved piece yeah. if Samuel Bick gets a song and a monologue and if Sarah Jane Moore has her own solo, and do you, do you think if there were a few less scenes and a few more songs mm. more evenly spread out, do you think this would be a bit slightly more of an acclaimed piece, a slightly more beloved piece, a slightly easier piece for people to choose as a sort that, of... That's a bit, it would be a more accessible piece of music for theatre, yeah. I think. Um... Well, when we did when they did it at my college... And mm. and on the actor musician course, and in many ways, it's perfect for that, because you get a lot of actor musicians who aren't actually singers. I mean, it's not very common, but you, like you know, I play my saxophone, and and don't worry, we do have a John Doyle production to talk about today, um, <laughs> of course. Uh, but I didn't know you played saxophone, Tom. I don't play saxophone. I don't play anything. Oh. It's the great tragedy of my I know. life. You, you, yeah. You, you've uh, just got no ear for music, have you? Excuse me. I have an incredible ear. John Weidman. It's a show about a group of people. They call you the Van Gogh of jazz. <laughs> you are. You are to music what David Beckham is to music. Um, John Weidman. It's a show about a group of people who committed political murders. What the show asks the audience is to spend some time with these people. We don't ask the audience to empathise with them or even sympathise with them, simply to see them as three-dimensional people. Completely true. I want to talk about... Let's talk about this now, just before we jump into the first song. What's going to happen if somebody else gets killed? Oh, as in like a president? Yes. <laughs> oh, you mean? Is it honestly, one of those shows the first thing that is my head is? Oh, will they write another song in another guy? <laughs> yeah, <that's, yeah. laughs> this is what I, like literally. John Wyman stop doing it. Like, is it one of those things where for ten years, twenty years, mm. they don't do assassins, and then twenty years later they finally do it again, and somebody has rewritten the final scene, or enough time has passed. You know, I literally I know this is incredibly morbid. When there were when there were sort of an incredible malevolence and violent atmosphere around the Trump administration, I and I thought maybe this is going to be the time that something happens, or even around Biden time. It it is inevitable that it'll happen again. Mm. Yeah, it's been it's been a long time though. That that you would have. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and also I think we'll talk about this later with the London production, but like we as a London audience or an English audience just have such a different relationship to gun violence and also the con I mean, I know that they tried to bomb Thatcher, but like the concept of political violence, like we've never had an assassination. I mean, some dickhead's gonna comment saying actually we, we Lawrence. Been, there's been a few attempts. Well, there was um, um, the Royals, and then there was um, Charles Dance. Charles Dance got 
blown up on a boat <laughs> by the AI. Large, <laughs> large boat battle, yes. Um, it really and shouldn't. Then, have, I, I think yeah. the Queen and Charles have had a few attempted. Yes. Um, yeah. But like, I, I just, I, I think it could be the situation where it doesn't go on. They don't do it for t- 10 years, 20 years or whatever. Yeah. And then suddenly somebody dares to put it on. Well, anyway, we'll talk about this in the future. We'll talk about this. <laughs> we'll do a bonus episode. Hi, guys. So, Stephen, uh, Stephen um, Harrison, the president of the United States, has been killed. What does this mean for an upcoming production of Assassins? Well, what do you think? <laughs> Um, but uh, no, I do think that that it. Do you think? An interesting well, question. Like, I, I, I'm going to be really morbid now, because obviously Sondheim's passed. Yeah. And John John Wideman is is 77 years of age. So, you know, I, I, this sounds horrible. If John Wideman passes as well, and there's none of the original team. I don't think it's touchable. I think, like, I, well, well, we're saying this, and now you know, Lin Manuel Miranda is working. You know, it's the it's the fifth it's the fifth musical since John Kander's death. <laughs> no, sorry, since Fred Ebb's death that has new music and lyrics by John Kander and yeah. Fred Ebb. New York, New York, what a flop! Huge flop, yeah. I do love when you catch up on Broadway or West End things, or even a movie like two years later. I was like, I'm going to say it now. Green Book shouldn't have won. And I said, yes, I know this will. <laughs> um, okay, let's talk about the opening number before we take our first break. Everybody's got the right. So it's Hail to the Chief as a waltz. I've, I've always loved that in that um, orchestration. I don't know what it is. Just that. Da, 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 da. And doing it so slow and pained just sounds so evocative. Um, and you have that shooting gallery, and it's the calliope, and it's the atmosphere of a carnival. What do you think of that incredible first image? I mean, oh, obviously great. you're a set designer, yeah. I love the set. It's, it's, yeah. it's yeah, it's big, it's lovely. It's but it's it's creepy. Anything fairground is always well, it's the theme of it's not just the set, is it? It's the mm. and any product. Well, I, I'm sure you'll tell me about. Modernized production. I'm sure John Doyle's wasn't set in a fairgrounds. It was set on a big flag. Was it? Yeah. <laughs> like, have I told you about our production of um uh what was it Songs for a New World? With the chairs. Uh yeah. Um we had to, there's a song where well, I couldn't really follow it to be fair. Um <laughs> that where someone's boy dies as a war veteran. And then so that dying they, as a war veteran is incredibly bad luck. <laughs> oh, sorry, they, they die in, in battle <laughs> as a soldier. And so they place the flag over this um black box. No, this uh, this black trunk so Re- reusable box. trunk, which I yeah. presume also was a bench at some point. And it, and it had a few costumes inside for on stage changes. G- great. <laughs> the Brett's there. Um and then um, yeah, and so two of them them carried off the uh the coffin like it was it was quite moving yeah. and then obviously the director went oh oh but there's a lot of song left what do they do now and then they all start stepping and clicking for the rest of this I'm like you've just taken off a dead car. <laughs> dead body it, it was it was funny it was funny yeah sounds great yeah um uh it, Sondheim had the same thing with the line come here and kill a president and like the first two lines Three lines or so, and he had the, and he talks about it in the same way he talks about the into the woods, and he t- says the exact same phrase of sitting up, making people sit up and get involved in the show rather than lulling back. You know, if you hear in the first two lines of it, somebody walks onto a stage, there's a carnival, come here and kill a president. What an incredibly provocative uh, notion. Um, the shoot to win concept, people coming in from the audience staging, and all this talk about winning prizes, and it does offer in this current in that in the production that we saw the notion of um, members of the audience. This could be any person, you know. This could be absolutely anybody, and they're coming up uh, to be involved in this um, because that is the terror. Obviously, yeah. is that it could be anybody. Um. We have him being 
sexist to the uh oh no sorry sorry we're doing that in a second uh so you didn't know about jody uh, john inkley jr's fascination with jody foster no no i didn't it took me by surprise as soon as, well, as, soon as jody foster came out i was like oh, okay tom likes this that's why <laughs> Well, now, surely you, the minute that you saw Booth and heard Ballad of Booth, you must have gone, mm -hmm. yeah. oh, I get it, yeah, so Tom wants to be Booth. Um, skill a little prize with the big blue eyes. Um, and then, you know, and then very similar line to uh, Dr. Strangelove, gentlemen, we can't fight in here, this is the war room. You know, they're fighting about who gets the gun and they go, please, please, no violence. And it's very funny. And again, the a great opening number that evocatively and perfectly encapsulates in five minutes the tone of the show the dark humor of the show all of the characters and yeah no i think it's a pretty exceptional opening number what did you think i really liked it it was a great yeah. way to introduce everyone um mm. yeah i enjoyed it what do you think it's, about it's, oh sorry go on i've i've got a hold on i get my notes up what do you think about the proprietor being sort of sexist to Squeaky and Sarah Jane? You know, hey, looking for a thrill, the Ferris wheel is that way. Don't forget the guns can go boom. Sondheim says the ballad, uh, the proprietor has a condescension that the the feminists among you might not appreciate. It's uh, well, doesn't he sort of represent the American dream? The proprietor. Yeah. Well, in many ways, yeah, uh, it's all about the I, American. That's dream. how I saw it, anyway. Yeah. No, 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 no. I can see that. He, he's yeah. tempting them with oh. This and then it's that, uh, and again, what and, and it comes full circle when the uh, convincingly Albie Oswald who says, "Oh, this is the American dream." In, in it's yeah. do that instead of kill yourself. So I think he works that he he's sexist because I I think <laughs> now there's now me saying Americans are all sexist, but I was oh, saying well, yeah. no, I know what you mean. In that sort of American dream, perfect utopia of sexism. Yeah, mm. and the um. There's a great moment. And then and then they're immediately the proprietor is constantly disappearing. They are immediately con consistently betrayed. And there's an incredible moment in the original production where he shoots uh JFK and he turns around and they're all gone. And he just holds for a minute before that big music starts again. And he's looking around as if like, where is everybody? Where where aren't you gonna help me now? And then he, he runs off as we as we know he did. Um or or do we know he did? <laughs> the and sorry, and then we oh, here, here's our pioneer, and it's all very low. Booth enters, and it's this big shadow, and it's this big gothic vision. And then what happens? Everybody's got the right, and he's and he's got that. It flashes that smile and the charisma, and we get this incredibly jaunty little tune that, in any other context could be used as like a we are the world anthem or something you know <laughs> and uh, and then we end with the guns pointed to the back of the stage which will mirror at the end but the guns will go into the audience and then fire up um but what a great opening yeah very nice um and then they have the pick a prez wheel and they give it a spin da, 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 da. ladies and gentlemen abraham lincoln and then booth excuse me and again, very funny, very darkly comic. And such an incredible balancing of tones to then go from that to then him screaming Six Emperor to Rennes, which means, Will? Oh, I don't know. It's, I believe it's death to the tyrant. It's what Brutus <laughs> said. It's what Brutus said when he killed oh, Julius Caesar. Oh, it wasn't what Booth said when he murdered. No, it was. So oh, it he... This is where my history my bizarre fascination with american presidents and all that comes in he was in he shot lincoln in the box i well, shot him in his head but he shot, shot him in the box then jumped to the stage from the box broke his leg broke his leg and screamed six emperor to Rennes, and and well ran off ho hobbled off um so yes and but he was quoting brutus i believe because he was a shakespearean actor and one of his he played in Julius Caesar, I believe. Oh, oh they're all actors, aren't they? They're all they're all, they're all they're all maniacs. Um, as a matter of fact, we're going to be talking a lot more about the Ballad of Booth after our first break. Which, where where is? Tell me now, Will. Before we take our first break, where was? Have you ranked all ten, or have you just done top five? I have a top four. 
Uh, the top four, and was no, everybody's no got order. the right? No particular order. Was everybody's got the right in there? Oh, sorry, I have top five. Yeah, everyone's got the, got the right, and Ballard and Booth are in my top five. Okay, and where was everybody? Oh, in, they're in no particular order. Yeah. Okay. Um. Very good. Uh, they are both in mine as well. I have everybody's got the right finale at seven. And we're back. At what stage, Will, of watching Assassins, did you realise that um, Booth is probably in my top three, five, excluding the women roles I'd like to play, uh, top three uh, Sundime roles I'd love to play? Really? I think so. Sweeney? Well, I... <laughs> I think I could sing George. Sweeney, George, Booth. I do love Ben from Follies. Who would I... Yeah, I guess I'd do Wolf and Cinderella's Prince. And you'd be the baker. I, I could do a Jack, probably, as well. <laughs> it's getting it's getting further and further away from Jack, Will. We all need to admit. We're all getting older. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we need to. Um, yeah, Jack. I, I, what am I missing? I don't think any of us could be in. I don't think it, could, it would be an incredibly experimental production. But I don't think either of us in Pacific Overtures is going to get oh, <laughs> going to get any budgeting currently. Um, and then pop. Po, he's not called polyamorous. <laughs> What's he called in Felon Felonius? In the lead in Funny Thing Happened. Oh yeah. Um... Anyway, yeah. but we all know we all still know that the best production would be uh <laughs> me as in drag as <laughs> Miss uh, as Mama Rose and you as Herbie. That would be genuinely great. <laughs> or me conceding and being Mrs. Lovett and you being Sweeney, or you re re uh, reprising Anthony, um, and I'll be Sweeney. There's so many, there's so many things that we could do. Um the ballad of Booth, however. Um I, th I think it's astounding. I mean, I, I've got it. I've got it number one. I, what What do you think? Before I say anything, what do you think, Well, of the Bella de Booth? I think it's lovely. I'd like to do it. Yeah. As the Balladeer. That could be a good duet, Will. I, I think I could pull off the, the Balladeer. Very well. I thought this as well whilst watching it. Because you have a, in your performing, Will, normally you have a youthful optimism that I think the balladeer always needs. And I think kind of gets in the way a little bit when you look at the Lee Harvey Oswald multi-rolling, but we'll talk about that later. But I think or the balladeer... Make the turn more significant? It does, in a world where we don't know that Lee Harvey Oswald is going to kill JFK. Yeah. It's you know it's we know the minute that I mean Sondheim talked about the when they did the original production all of the sets were quite abstract and minimalist apart from the book depository and the carousel turned around and it was completely realistic the correct walls the correct windows the correct boxes and an or the audience gasped every night because 1991 1963 24 years. No. Seven. <laughs> 20, 28 years. That's nothing, really, when you think about it. That is... That's like, it, it's verging on 9-11 for us. Yeah. About, yeah, about 9-11 era. If you, yeah. And I'm, but this is the thing, we're in such a world of accelerated media. I mean, in what year did that terrible Robin Pattinson movie come out? Twilight. <laughs> no, what's the movie? Remember oh, me? Oh, no, no don't remind me about Tenet. Oh my god! Do you remember when we all had to pretend to love Tenet because we wanted the cinemas to be back? <laughs> it is. It is the um, yeah. It's the only film I remember going to see in a mask. Uh, I watched it. Well, I mean, I was at the cinema all the time. I yeah. I was I was so happy to get back to the cinema. They did a re-release of Dirty Dancing, and it was me. And a group of middle-aged women uh, who kept it was like Rocky Horror for them. And to be honest, I enjoyed it. You know, I hope I hope you're getting your money's worth. Oh, she is. And you know, and, oh, oh, you know, oh, not him again. And it was um, 
the minute that Johnny Castle walked on, they all went, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> so it was very funny in that sense. But yeah, Ballad of Booth, Sondheim. S history gets simplified and often prejudicially pushed in one direction or another, and often through the use of such things as folk songs. Oftentimes, things get passed down through songs and stories. And that's obviously an incredibly um, intrinsic concept to the whole production. You know, the majority of the songs are called The Ballad of, Ballad of Cholgash, The Ballad of Booth, The Ballad of Gateau. Um, and, and yeah, the concept of the folk song and passing that um, historical oration and passing history down through stories who gets to tell the story who gets to sing the song um and and i love specifically with the ballad of booth and i guess G Ch ballad of Guto is is um structured the same way in that it's kind of two different songs back and forth and back and forth like we have this in i mean i'm not saying they don't mesh they do but like we have ding 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 ding. Johnny Booth was a headstrong fella, and we have the 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 ball the quote unquote the ballad of Booth, and then in the middle of that we have this incredibly almost operatic, yeah, like epiphany esque, constantly shifting modalities and shifting rhythms, and uh, clashed together, um, and the whole motivation of ballads part of the uh, Booth's part of the song, pardon me, is um that he wants the story to be told. He doesn't want to be lost to history. He doesn't want to be um, misquoted in any way. He doesn't. He wants the right truth of why he did what he did to be historicalized and to be forever remembered. And the irony being that, of course, now, in a musical by one of the great composers of all time, he, I mean, you know, the historical act, nobody's going to forget Booth. But like, I don't think I really knew. I'm not saying that this is... a complete piece of historical fiction but i don't think i knew before about um booth being a politically motivated murderer i always thought it was something to do with the acting and of course that's what gets brought up in the songs you know was it is that the reason tell us john or is it you know bad reviews mm. do you think the humor works in this song do you think it pays off uh yes yeah because I think the darker moments are then then very dark. I mean, it's very similar, you know, like to it's very similar to me of uh, what is it? The end of Epiphany into that's all very well and good. Now, what are we going to do about the Italian to go from, uh, you know, let them cry, dirty traitor. They will understand it later. The country is not what it was. A man killing himself. And then what's yeah. the first thing we hear? Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Johnny Booth was a headstrong fella. You know, what he was was off his head. Very good. Um, I sent you the COVID production, um, and and I, I, Sophia is a wonderful singer, but she didn't play the comedy of those beats. And I think it just, if, if, you, if you don't play the comedy in direct juxtaposition with that tragedy the tone and the whole motivation of the piece can get really blurry and really grey. Um, originally Sundime, one of these Sundime ideas, very similar to him wanting to just use 12 notes for Sunday in the Power of George because George at Sarah only used 12 colours and that got throughout. He originally wanted to use rhythmic gunshots. Again, a nice idea in concept, but I don't know if that, you know, would have lasted a whole show or, you know. Um, you would, you mentioned Brecht earlier. You know, we have the Brechtian elements of the staging here. Booth getting costumed by the proprietor, the the soot on his face, the wrap-up of his arm, uh, sorry, of his leg, pardon me. Um, how the nation... Uh, I love the, the compar comparisons within songs. And we have... Uh, Booth saying how the nation can never be the hope that it was, and him saying the country is not what it was, paired with um, the balladeer later, soon the country is back where it belongs. Uh, I, I Such incredible... Pa it's very similar for me to who out there could love you more than I... You know, if you put any, mo if any power at all into that phrase... And similarly, mm. if you put any power into let them cry, dirty traitor, they will understand it later. I mean, it, it breaks your heart listening to it. 
even though a moment ago you were hearing him scream the N word and 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 it's incredibly evocative at work. Um, big subject, but let's touch on it. We, I mean, we do have a relationship to gun violence, particularly, you know, um, in, you know, but not on the level of America. And I cannot even imagine this. This is 1991. This originally first comes out. And then we watched it in 2004. I don't know what the reaction is in an audience listening to the words, listen to the stories, hear it in the songs, angry men don't write the rules and guns don't write the wrongs. I can only imagine that it's a mixture of, of exultation and, you know, happiness. And, but then I, I don't know, but, what an incredible! It, it's it's really the only line in the show that is like, paint by numbers. This is bad. Um, but it works, and the balladeer is a great role. Um, we've already said it, but do you think the balladeer is a great role, or do you think it is? Yeah, a oh, I love of, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know me. I I love a narrator role in a musical. Yeah. Very shay. Very shay. <laughs> um. So, Michael Cerberus won Best Featured Actor in a Musical for the Tony Award, um, and he was nominated um, up against Dennis O'Hare as Gateau and beat him. Um, and he was given the award by Sean Puff Daddy <laughs> B. Diddy Combs <laughs> because he was on Broadway doing a production of Raisin in the Sun, which apparently he was quite good in, but a uh, very odd moment. And he put, uh, he said, thanks for proving you don't have to kill somebody to get one of these on Broadway. You just have to pretend to. <laughs> um, he described Booth as unnatural, passionate, and ultimately truly page. Oh, sorry, described the show, pardon me. <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it's passionate and ultimately truly patriotic. And I think there is something in there, in that in the end, the show is quite patriotic in the sense of, how would you describe it? Do you think this is a patriotic show? Do you think that oh, this yeah. show oh, loves yeah. America? Yeah, it, along the same lines of Hamilton, I would say. It's up yeah. there. Pointing... I didn't enjoy Hamilton. Yeah. <laughs> exact same set. <laughs> exact same... Just going to say it. what you were going to bring up? <laughs> no, I didn't, but it just popped yeah. into my head now. Yeah. Um, he thanked the swings way before Hugh Jackman did... <laughs> This person could have played any... <laughs> it's been far too long, Will, since we've made jokes oh, we about Hugh Jackman's yeah. Music Man run. Um, uh, he said he thanked Raul Esperanza, who was nominated, and said he's going to be up here any day now. Still hasn't. Sorry, Raul. Um, oh. Do you think he'll win it for Fagin? I don't know how that works. Tony Awards availability. Um, not availability. What's it called? Eligibility. Eligibility. Um, because it was only a short run and it was at yeah. City on the Square. I don't know how Have that you works. heard the rumours that Jekyll and Hyde is being revived in West End with Ramin? Okay. Yeah, we can go watch that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Bring on the men. I heard Bring on the Men because my friend Oli Ange did it in one of our musical theatre classes and I was like, this is wonderful. What's this from? And I was like, Oh, okay. Is this actually yeah. secretly good? And then, oh, I th I th well, what version you did you listen to or watch a version? I listened. Oh, it's okay. No, it is good. It just Great. feels like it feels like Sweeney Todd fan fiction, don't you think? No. Okay, that's okay. It's good. No, it is good. It is good. And I wish I could have seen it. You, Will obviously you can tell them. Will was. Oh, I'm sure we have. How how many weeks away was it from going on? Will got COVIDed. He was directing Jekyll and Hyde. Uh oh, let's have a think. Um, it was probably about four weeks away. Five, four, five weeks. Yeah, because I'd planned a secret trip up. Yeah, shame. We move out of Ballad of Booth, and then we get. Uh, Charles Gateau doing a speech about, you know, and, you know, here's to the president, you know, the office of the president of the United States. How do these scenes work for you? Do they, I, I'm not 
obviously they're not your favorite part, but I don't think any of them are quite bad or anything. It's all right. Yeah. Yeah. And we get in there the same thing of Cholgash discussing how a gun is made, which becomes musicalized later with the gun song. But that that concept of before a gun kills anybody, it's made in a factory. And Cholgash worked in factories himself and those incredibly horrible uh, turn of the century conditions uh, that you can't even imagine. Uh, and again, we're back into the dark humor. Ch Zangara is uh, screaming about his stomach and, oh, my stomach. And, you know, Booth. Have you considered killing Franklin Delano Roosevelt? You think it would help? Couldn't hurt. Um, and we get How I Save Roosevelt. Uh, what do you think of How I Save Roosevelt? Well, lovely and jaunty and... Yeah. No, it's not in my top five at all. It's my number six. Hmm. But but again, all of the songs have a similar sort of really upbeat, yeah. really John D'Souza march, and then suddenly, no laugh, no funny. It's a nice, yeah, it's a nice a nice way to, it's a nice ensemble-y mm. song. And it's a good concept, rather than about him, it's about the witnesses. Yeah. Well, it's, as you'd imagine, absolute accuracy to the five bystanders' true stories. <laughs> um, so basically, Zangaro, this is all true, Zangaro was five feet tall, and the speech was unusually short. And so the audience leapt to their feet just about the time that he was going to jump up and shoot. So he had to stand on the chair and the chair wobbled. And that's how he missed. Um, on the other hand, John Schrank, who also attempted to kill Teddy Roosevelt, shot him, but the bullet lodged in a 50-page speech in his breast pocket. And this is from Sondheim. So one Roosevelt was saved by being long-winded and the other by being terse. A ripe opportunity for a song, if ever I heard one. Yeah. <laughs> but of course he didn't write that song. Uh, and we get the electric chair, big finish. Um, I'll mention this now. Does this... Does the ensemble... Do you think the ensemble works? I... Necessary. Does, does there need to be an ensemble? Or because I th I couldn't get complete confirmation on this, but I was listening to the interviews around the Jamie Lloyd, Aaron Tavetz, Catherine Tate production that they did at the um, Many Air Chocolate Factory. And Aaron Tavetz says, and I, again, I'm only inferring here, he says they're on stage the whole time and they do a lot of multi-rolling. And in a lot of the pictures, I couldn't really see. Now, I could be completely wrong, completely. But does this work if... You cut out the five ensemble members and do some multi rolling. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I was it's thinking just, the same. I guess. Thing. Well, it, it depends who's putting it on. For example, if if a university society were putting it this on, this is yeah, ripe opportunity yeah, to yeah, more opportunities for roles. But also, you some people could argue if these murderers murder they're murderers. That's what I'm <laughs> calling them now, not assassins. They're, but if, if the um if the principals stay as that person the entire show, then they won't get confused and then it I don't know. No, no I agree. I, I, I completely think if if I were to put it on with multi role. I think the biggest problem is something just broke. I don't know if that does work if mm. Booth comes up. I mean, I'm I'm not doubting the credibility of the actors in your team or any team that would do it, but like does does it work if Booth's just done a ten minute scene, goes off, takes off his wig, puts on a new moustache or whatever, puts on a, a normal white shirt, and he's just been lonely? And then I was out in the yard. I don't know if the, I don't know if that does work. I think the whole. Oh, then we go. We'll talk about this later. But is something's just broke necessary? Mm. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, the electric chair, big finish. Nice. Very, very good. Uh, scene with Emma Goldman. Very long. Not necessary. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Cholgash. Uh, she's described by Weidman in the in the book as a turn-of-the-century agitator and feminist. She was a real woman. This is a fictionalised meeting of the two of them. He's been following her around for all of her speeches. I, it, it's necessary in a sense, but I think we get a good job of knowing who Cholgash is before this anyway. Uh, then we get two scenes back to back, and this is where this feels weird. We get two scenes back to back, and we get Squeaky Fram and Sarah Jane Moore um, eating the KFC. 
And it's this whole, Charlie says this, Charlie says that, and it's funny and it's great. Do you think it's a missed opportunity to make these two the comedy characters? Yeah, I, I see what you mean there. Yeah. Is it kind of, is it not offensive, but is it kind of like, why are they any more stupid or ridiculous than Don Inkley Jr. or whatever, you know? I'm not at all saying that it's a sexist decision or anything like that, but it it, it could be read that way. And, and it's not that I don't laugh as much as anybody when she's screaming at the kid or drags on the dead dog. Um, but, yeah. I mean, they're linked because, after all, they both did and failed to kill Gerald Ford. Um, and so they're linked in that sense. But beyond that, and there is that bizarre uh, true fact that Sarah Jane Moore did go to school with Charlie Manson. Um, did you know anything about Squeaky From and Charles Manson, Will, or anything like that? No, no. No, I'm not really into my American history. No. I don't really know anything. You did know about Sharon Tate, thank God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you've read a book, <laughs> you know. I, re I can't. I st that still boggles me that people didn't know about that before. Once upon a time in Hollywood, and we're just like, why was Sharon? Yeah, why was Margot? Ro yeah. the, the ending it just does, doesn't work then if you don't no. know Sharon. Yeah, why was Margot Robbie in it? The amount of times I heard, but like, why was Margot Robbie in it? And I was crying in the cinema. I don't, I just, you know, anyway. Um, then we get the gun song. What do you think of the gun song, Will? Top five. Top five. Ooh. I have it at eight, but do love it. And I'm happy to make it a top six or what bring six onto the. Tell me like why you love the gun song. I really liked when they all sing together in the wonderful harmony. Yes, yes, yeah, lovely. All you have to do is... And and it's kind of a bit of a mosaic. We get the Cholgash opening and the Cholgash closing. We get the choral stuff. We get Zangar's, what a wonder is a guy, what a wonderful invention. And then we get Sarah Jane's only real musical moment, you know. You know, I got, this really... <laughs> I got this really great gun. Where is it? Um... Yes, it's very, it's very musical. It's very choral and very, mm. it's it's lovely. No, you're right. That great harmony that of all four of them broken and all you have to do, shit, I shot it, and it's quite funny. I I do find that like a funny moment. Um, and and, and Zangara, uh, sorry, uh, guitar coming on first when everybody has a gun. <gasps> everybody pays attention and giving a book to somebody on the front row. Who would you want to play, Will? Oh, okay. Um, I I do think Balladeer, mm. uh, Booth, or declined. declined. Okay, or I don't know if you're expecting this one. Maybe, maybe, perhaps. <laughs> Who, who sings uh, Worthy of Your Love? John Hinckley Jr. Yeah, Hinckley, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a great song. That's my number yeah. two. I'll jump the gun. Yeah. That's my number oh, two. Yeah. Absolutely <laughs> astounding. I yeah. would come take you from your life. Um, anyway, gun song's great. Uh, then then we get into the Ballad of Joel Gash, which I have at... Uh, I have it at number five, but I'm willing to play around. I am... Um, yeah. It, it, it's. I think all of the ballads are, are exceptional, great songs. Uh, but I, I only put uh, the the Booth ballad in my top five. But I'm I'm happy to. It's one of the, this is the this is the double edged sword with it being only ten songs. In that, like you know, they're all pretty great. <laughs> anyway, ballad of Cholgash. We had that great staging of the line and the cue. Obviously, mm, um, very good. Uh, Cholgash was a successful assassin. And we have this big build up and, you know, Charles Gash, working man. And it has that, you know, typical Sondheim list by the Phantom of Lilies, by the God of Abundance, by the da -da 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 -da. Um, Doesn't have, it isn't structured in the same way that the other ballads are in the, you know, it doesn't then, or even how I say Roosevelt. His own moment. Yeah. And I guess that's it's because we've had that before with Gunsong. You know, he has a lot of them. Yeah. And I don't think musically 
Ballad of Cholgash <laughs> breaking halfway through and then going into it takes a lot of men to make a gun. You know, I do think this works. I mean, on the original album, it's down as the gun song slash Ballad of Cholgash. They go one into the other. I split them up, obviously, because I see them as two songs. But um, uh, they are seen as one song on the original cast album. And so in that sense, it is all... It is Cholgash's 10 minutes, you know. Um, but no, very good. And then we meet Sam Bick for the first time, and he's uh, sending his... Uh, <laughs> His tapes to uh, Leonard Bernstein. Um, and if you can't listen to it now, Lenny, maybe you can listen to it. Tonight, tonight. I love that song. What a melody. What a sentiment. And uh, I did do it as Al Pacino. Al Pacino, yeah. yeah I did do it. Um, well, it was the middle of COVID and uh, I got the Santa costume out of the loft and um, yeah, just went mental around the house and edited it all together and started throwing dartboard, printed off pictures of Richard Nixon and threw darts at them. And oh, is this for uni? Yeah, I sent you it. Oh, I've not seen. I've not watched that one. The COVID when I was in COVID, I was both Zangara and Big. Wow, wow! I'll show you it when you come over later. Let the record show, ladies and gentlemen, that it is my birthday. I, um, oh, yes, I've not even wished you a happy birthday. Happy birthday, Tom. Thank you, thank you. I'm off to Asda after this to get your card. You'll be happy to know. I didn't write anything in it. They write their own now. <laughs> well, no, they've always... <laughs> you could put that it in It says happy birthday on the front, doesn't it? Yeah, it says you didn't write anything in it. Well, that's what writing is for on card, the kid, obviously. You know, uh, we'll put that in, Egypt. We'll put that in something. Why, why is it a card? It's what could stand up on you. <laughs> Oh, let's look at it. It bends. You can do it this way. You can't read it that way, but you You're can. You're doing, doing it as Jeff from... Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. You're like, what, why have you not written on the envelope? Well, who else is it going to be? Who else am I going to be? <laughs> I'm, I'm giving it to you. <laughs> you don't need to put your name on it. Yeah, do it. Hey, you know. <laughs> you know, I'm not this good. <laughs> I could see Jeff as an assassin. Well, th this brings me on to something I thought. Well, uh, back before I, I properly knew about assassins a few years ago, mm -hmm. I always thought it was assassins in a loose term, more about American killers. And I thought people like John Wayne Gacy, that those sort of people were in wow. the show. What if assassins was just with serial killers instead? Like, that would be good, wouldn't it? <laughs> with Jeffrey Dahmer, John Wayne Gacy, then you'd have like um... Spooky Mormon Hell's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um Danny Cochran, Jeffrey Dahmer, Jack the Ripper. Yeah, I think it'd be great. Have you watched the episode of Psychoville that literally has a musical moment with all of these people? No, it's very good. It's exactly what you're talking about. Um, but where? Sorry, where's the empathy? Where's the where's the propulsion? Where's somebody's written Jack the Ripper the musical? Oh yeah, in the style of Sweetie and Jekyll. Um, and then we move on to a moment between Squeaky, uh, Squeaky Fromm and John Hinckley Jr., who are both killing uh, for love, and because of their you know, and we killing have this for love. Which remind? Have you seen the new trailer? Um, for for a new um. Like three part drama coming up on ITV starring um oh what's she called? Um Sharon she was in Smith. No, um you'll you'll be disgusted that I can't remember her name. She was in um she was in the ninth circle uh, num number nine and also The Ninth uh, Circle number nine. No, what's the Game Game of Thrones one? The Game of Th Oh Lindsay Duncan. Lindsay Duncan, yeah. And and the, it's like a load of pensioners. Well, and like if I if I if I get diagnosed with illness, you're gonna kill me, aren't you? And we're doing it for love. And it's like this gang, we kill each other for love. It's it's, <laughs> it, it's been advertised like that sounds good. I can't yeah. believe that you described her as the critic from Simon Says instead of Astrid the Waters of Mars, the, waters of Mars, the greatest 90 minutes ever televised. If I'm not victorious, he's wrong. Yes. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. What an incredible Great. 70 minutes. 
Uh, and then we get, un sorry, and then Squeaky bullies John, uh, John Inkley Jr. Um, about, uh, let's talk about this now. John Inkley Jr. has been released from prison um, and has his own YouTube channel and is still writing songs. These are some of his titles. He's, let the record show, he made a full statement saying that he was very sorry uh, to the Reagans. Uh, he also paralyzed, uh, I think he's called Jim Brady, um, somebody else when he was, and, and wounded two other people when he kept shooting to kill Reagan. And he killed Reagan because he wanted, with one big statement, to prove his love to Jodie Foster, who he had fallen madly in love with after watching Taxi Driver and sort of being fascinated by Such the... Con reason. Yes, yes, Will, yes. This is 1981, yes. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. What did you think I was going to say? Panic room. <laughs> Um, she, she's a child. She was a child, and it has. I guess he was. They're all bonkers mentalists, aren't they? Yes, and there is a, the way that Jody was dealt with around that time, and she is. Con There's an incredible interview, and she is. I don't want to say this and be inferred the wrong way because it sounds badly, but she is so adult to me, even when she is a child, and I know that could be said. You know, I know, I know, I know, well, I know. Adding that to the Carruthers soundboard. <laughs> soundboard. <laughs> but like her composure and when she's asked all these questions and she's a, still a very young girl and or a young woman or a teenager. And she just says, I can't talk about it, I'm afraid, because I don't want it to jeopardize the case. And I, uh, such, such pose. And, How was and she it, involved? Well, he sent a love letter, psychotic love yeah. letters all the time. Yeah, sorry. And anyway, so these are some of the songs that are on his YouTube channel. I'm finally living free. Never ending quest. Lonely dreamer. Our lives are bound to grow. She's I'm, my one and only. <laughs> I need the album. <laughs> and <laughs> surrender to the love. Um, however, he does say that he is uh, very sorry to Jodie Foster. How do you think he... He reacted when he found out that he's not her type. <laughs> we should write that play. He's in prison. And he's like, what? <laughs> well, there you go. No reason she didn't reply to <laughs> yeah, that He no blames wonder. that. That's he, he why. Then... That's why I see. <laughs> he then, he then That's like, the reason. I'm going to kill every person who didn't vote for legal straight marriage. Sorry, for, to legalise gay marriage. I'm going to do it for you, Jody. <laughs> Uh, uh, and then great. and then we get Unworthy of Your Love, which in any oh, other context beautiful. would be one of just the all-time love songs. And even if you listen to this song without knowing the context, Charlie and Jody must be the other person. You know, when they did it for putting it together, which was a con which was a, a show they did on Broadway with John Barrowman and Ruthie Henschel and Carol Burnett and George Hearn. And it was John Barrowman and Ruthie Henschel, and they say, um, they just say darling, darling, and baby and sweetheart, I think. Um, but it's an incredible love song. It's um it's very contemporary for Sondheim. It's well, it's it's something that you could come straight out of um once. Yeah. Well, it's a pastiche of those great 70s sort of love songs because we're going through the eras. I think that's another thing. I think we talked about this with uh I can't remember, but like the fact that the final assassination temp is in the 70s does make you wonder if there was an 80s assassination attempt, would he have tried to write an 80s song? Since to... Spock. Yeah, like this is the thing, isn't it? It's like he wrote Unworthy of Your Love in that 70s pastiche to sound like a 70s pop hit. What if, I don't know, 1985, somebody takes a shot at, at well, technically, Ray, but I think it was 81. So it is in that 70s era. But like, what if somebody in 1989 gets shot and he's like, dum, bum, bum, dum, bum, 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 dum, dum. I just can't get it. <laughs> no. I, um, I mean, I, I have no doubt he would have rise to the challenge and pulled it off. But there is something about the acoustic aesthetic of the 70s pop ballad <laughs> that fortunately fits into the overall musical uh world of folk songs and assassins we we don't have to have too big a leap hmm. um but yeah no unworthy of your love is is i i i, right. I love it i love it um Top that five. that bridge i will go dig you baby i die for you even though even though we do a good and worthy of your love 
Me and what? Me as Squeaky yeah. Frog? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> never, never thought about that, but we'll try it later. Um, then we get the one scene that I don't think works, the one John Wideman scene that doesn't work for me, which is when Charlie Gateau, um comes up behind Sarah Jane Moore and like, accosts her. And he's like, I'm a very terrifying and imposing figure. And he like flirts with her and he grab, gropes her a little bit. And it's like, I don't get it. Is this like, oh, he was, he was, he was a pervert as well. Because well, then we're like, yeah. um, no, I'm not saying, yeah, I get it. But like, we're then, he, he, he accosts her and then he's straight into, oh, my train is here. Yeah. And then, oh, I want to be the ambassador of France. And he got mad as a hatter. And then he kills him. It's like, really do think uh, you could have lost that. It felt like, let's get another scene with Sarah. When really, they should have just given her a song. And then we get, mm, we've got four minutes, 18, we can do it. Let's talk about the Ballad of Gateau. Is this in your top five? Uh, no. No, it's my number four, but we can play around with this. I'm up, uh, I, my second favourite ballad, if you'd like to know. I would like to know that, yes. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. Um, so, well, these are, uh, this is one of the only times, if not the only time, that Sondheim has used other people's lyrics because these were the real words of Charles Gateau that he wished to have an orchestra and choir perform at his hanging. Wow. Yeah. The whole I am going to the Lordy, not... Any yeah. of the child, any of the ballad, the balladier stuff, but the, I'm going to the Lordy. I'm so glad I I'm going to the Lordy. Patrick Harris. <laughs> <laughs> <Isn't it? laughs> um, in a way, Sundime gave him his wish, and and I think like there is something again, something about that. Like this man who killed another man and wished on his deathbed, not on his deathbed, wished as his final wish to have a choir and orchestra perform his music. And that is, you know, not, and that was never going to happen. And now, 500 years later, or 200, I have no concept of time, every single night on a Broadway stage, that music is heard and, and applauded. Weird sort of thing. Weird sort of playing around, you know. Um, Sondheim. I am now going to read some, oh, sorry, this is Gateau. I am now going to read some verses which are intended to indicate my feelings at the moment of leaving this world. If set to music, they may be rendered very effective. The idea is that of a child babbling to his mama and papa. I wrote it this morning about 10 o'clock. Um, so, yeah, he wrote it at 10 o'clock and he wants a full orchestra and choir. Hey, hey, I, I only got this job 10 days ago. <laughs> <laughs> hey! Charles Gateau, crazy. He wanted to be the ambassador to France. Who would want that? Have you ever been to France? But you know what? Sarah Jane Moore has big boobies. <laughs> she does have big boobies. <laughs> squeaky from. All I'm saying is squeaky bed frame. <laughs> you know, him and her and Charlie Manson. Um, oh. This is now four months after Joe Hook was... Um, <laughs> <laughs> horrific Gordon Glow's mind. Have you watched John Mulaney do it at the Governor's Awards? No, no. It's hilarious. Why mm -hmm. on why on earth is he yeah. not hosting everything? Um that is John Mulaney becoming the new Billy Crystal is the only situation I'll be happy with that isn't me becoming the new Billy Crystal <laughs> Oscars host. Um so yeah, we have this incredible staging. The we're finally, well, not finally utilizing, but we're really utilizing now the staircase. And yep. I'm going to the Lordy. Dennis O'Hare is sensational here, and that final hitting of the high note and the dropping of the uh, Joseph Bouquet fans for the Opera Dummy. Um, and there's a gasp in the audience. Did you hear that? No, I heard a gasp and a real yeah. silence. And I don't know if that is because the dummy was really realistic. Um, I don't know. Uh, but the climbing of the stair, Donis O'Hare was nominated in the same category and did lose to Michael Cerverus. Do you think that that's the right decision, Will? Uh, yes. Yes, I, I think... It's a it's a more difficult song because you've got some A-flats in there. Yeah. But also, just overall performance-wise, you not only get the quote-unquote best song in the show, you also get 
a 10 minute extended scene led by you, which is really yeah. well written. No matter what yeah. else we say about John Weidman's other scenes, uh, and we'll talk about it after the break. Um, no matter about what we say about the other scenes of the book, that scene, November the, you know, November the 23rd, is absolutely astounding. And we're going to be talking about it and the rest of the show after our second and final break as we conclude and wrap up. Assassins. Um, third and final, thank you, seamless. Uh, third and final part. We just talked about the Ballad of Gateau. Um, we then get another scene with Squeaky and Sarah Jane Moore. Gunshot, Squeaky, uh, sorry, Sarah Jane dragging on the dead dog. Uh, this is definitely the funniest of the scenes. Funny, yeah. Involves a kid. Why do they do this sometimes? Not one scene? Yeah, for child labour laws. Why do they do it? And it'll have to be a different kid every night. Yeah, I mean, he's in um, How I Saved Roosevelt, just saying, mm -hmm. do, you want a, do you want a lollipop? Great. It's like in bloody Merrily We Roll Along, that awful kid. It was like, Merrily We Roll Along, Roll Along. I was like, oh my God, alive. Mm -hmm. um, following dreams. That's how long this series has been going on. When we did Merrily We Roll Along, we talked about, you know, how that production was going to be launching soon and it'll be. Uh, now we've got a cash recording and it's wonderful and we talked on our Sweeney episodes about how Josh Groban and Annalie Ashford were going to be in a production of Sweeney and now we've heard that and that is terrible what well, she's terrible yeah yeah I've, I've, I'm very excited for it to come to the West End that production I'll, I'll be definitely watch, going to watch do we know do you think it'll well, transfer the word on the street is that they want to do it on Broadway for a very long time like they do um, Chicago like you know, mm -hmm. special, you know, sp where people come in for three months. Yeah. The problem is, is that Chicago is Chicago and you can learn two songs quite quickly. Mm -hmm. Pretending that Sweeney and Mrs. Lovett are roles, I'm not denying the, the talent and craft that goes into Chicago, but like you can bring in Gemma Collins to do When You're Good to Mama and that'll be fine. Well, no, it wasn't. She didn't even oh, no, go she, through she it. Did, did it. <laughs> <laughs> but you can let Pamela Anderson did it for at six months or something as Roxy. Sure. I don't know how that, well, yeah, it, it could come over. It could come over. We've not had Beetlejuice yet. We're more likely to get Beetlejuice first, I think. Well, we're getting Mean Girls, aren't we? Yes, we are. It's, at the um, Savoy. Sunset Boulevard has just, just finished. You really enjoyed that, didn't you? Enjoyed parts. She was sensational. It's only Nicole... the beginning. <laughs> What? It's only the beginning. I, I was singing Sunset Boulevard. Sunset Boulevard. Yeah. What uh, line the, was that? The, oh, the, the, just the like you will wind up in the ocean. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, everyone's forgotten how they started. Um, Wait. Ellie's changed a lot over the years since those brave gold rush pioneers came in their creaky covered wagons. Far as they could go into the line, their dreams were yours, their dreams were mine, but then those dreams were hidden dragons. So it's not that one. Um... Opening to Act Two. Yes, Sunset Boulevard, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, how does it start? Sure, I was came it, out here to make my name one of my pull. Fooling Around was only the beginning? Fooling Around was only the beginning? No. Am I making this up? No. You're making no. this up. For something about, you know, just... It's, everyone's forgotten how they started here at Sunset Boulevard. Um, anyway. Um, I love Sunset Boulevard. What a show. And yes, Nicole was sensational. Oh, yeah, yeah, undeniably. Um, okay, and then Squeaky and uh, Sarah J. Moore have an argument. You know, I'd rather be a stupid housewife than a teenage slut. And, and it builds and it builds and it builds and she calls Charlie an asshole. And then we get the, the you know, the concept of them both trying to kill this the same... This thing here is only the beginning. <laughs> yes. I think it was only the beginning. Once you've won, you have to go on winning. You think I've mm. sold out, dead right? I've sold out. I've just been waiting. Jackpot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a great song. I sing that very well, though. That's always been my audition song. Really? You're not surprised by that. Um, Apparently, I performed it, and it's quite erotic, apparently, when I perform it, but that's another matter entirely. Um, And then we get this scene where Gerald Ford stumbles on. 
and falls over and helps them pick up the bullies, which is very funny. And he's like, good doggy. And, and he, and he, you know, Oh, I've got one in my ear, which is very, very funny. Um, but I just, I don't understand the conceit. Like, you know what I mean? It's one of those things where it's in, it's all abstract. So it can be at any time, you know, in any place in that sort of thing. So it does work. It's funny. She throws the bullets off stage. Bang, bang. <laughs> it's funny. It's funny. Yeah. And that's about it, really, isn't it? Could have been a song. Could have been a song. Yeah. Uh, and then we get, we do get a song with another national anthem. Um, what did you think of another national anthem, Will? Really liked it. Top five. Okay. Rock and roll. Wow. I have it at nine. Okay. Not that I don't love it. Let me get this record. Let me get this straight. There isn't a song in this show that I don't like. Actually, is there one for you that I, that I don't like? Don't like. I think there was one that annoyed me. There always is, isn't there? Um, mm -hmm. We've you've said that you liked all of the ones up until this point, so that just leaves something just broke. Hmm. Oh, it was to start with. I found the ballady bits, the number yeah. a bit. Oh, really? Are we are we doing that? <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah, um, but then they grow on you like a folk song. Yeah. Tell me why this is in your top five. Why do you love it so much? Not that you're in the place of defense. I really like it. I I just think it's very good. Everybody says their reasons, and then you know the balladeer is you know trying to will them over, and you know, and it's all built around these concepts that we hear over and over again of like the mailman wins the lottery and the usherette's a rock star, and by this time, no, never going to happen. It's bullshit, and is the absolute anger and disillusionment of the assassins against the ultimate optimism of the balladeer, um, and well, yeah. And turn him into Lee Harvey Oswald. Lee Harvey Oswald, don't they? Is this more effective if his shirt's unbuttoned the whole show and we see the white shirt, He's or would that be too obvious? I mean, he he looks like Lee Harvey Oswald in his balladeer costume. Sure, yeah. As soon as he's on in, in Ballad of John Ruth, you know, mm. oh, okay, it's Lee Harvey Oswald. Well, Did I you? I, anyway, yeah. I, I, I think... I, I didn't, because I didn't know the twist. Okay, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um, so as soon as it came on, because I was like, okay, I'm going, I'm watching a musical about a load of a, a people who have killed presidents. Yeah. He walks on. That's Lee Harvey Oswald in it. In it. Um, I think when I was, a, I think yeah. when I first watched it, I fell for it. I think I, I just completely, f well, not forgotten about him, but I, I, I was just like, okay, we're not doing a song about JFK. All right, sure. I guess it's older assassins or whatever. But it is quite glaring when you think about it, about, you know, the whole time. Where's Lee? Well, 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 well we're here now. Let's talk about it. So, well, um, Hold on. One, on. one more thing from me. I I think the musical would, would be better if uh, the balladeer and the proprietor were merged into one role. And then, therefore, the balladeer, balladeer feels like this because uh, the what is the purpose of the proprietor? He just gives them the guns and sings that song. He gives them the up. guns, gives that song. In this the production, he leads. In this production, he leads another national anthem. Yeah, but I think they should be merged. So the balladeer or proprietor, who you want to choose, mm. is that through line narrating, choosing, and uh, positioning these characters all the way through, which then and and then it suits more of the like the circusy ringmastery costume or. Vibe, which then makes them all turning on him and turning him into one of them better. I think That's the problem is, I think for me, the problem is just that they're not balanced. I don't think we'd be having this conversation if the proprietor led one of the ballads, balladeer songs. Because for me, they so clearly represent two different things. The balladeer is the folk song, he is history, he is how these people have been remembered and sort of being an objective, optimistic viewpoint. And the proprietor is that pure evil almost uh, giving them the motivation to do the deed and the evil deed I, I i think the ballad the proprietor if anything needs another song and then you can see them and stage it more like 
um, two evil forces going against each other. Sorry, the, the force of good, the force of evil. Mm -hmm. And they're both trying to convince them, maybe, and make that more of the staging. Um, but at the end of the day, the proprietor only has one song, which is which why I think is effective with another national anthem um, giving him this. Because originally this was led by Bick um, completely throughout. Um, which works. Bick's not... Oh, no, no, you don't like that. No, no, you know, I get Yeah, he, he is the... Of all of them, he is the one that's going to start this song. That sort of man it revolts. Let, let's fucking get him. Yeah. Mm. And whereas... Yeah. So I, I, I see what you mean, but I do think you'd lose something. Um... Sondheim, this is where the optimism of the balladeer is put up against the disillusionment of the assassins. All this talk about where's my prize? I want a prize. Don't I get a prize? I deserve a fucking prize. And that concept of what we deserve against what we want. You know, everybody has the right to be happy. Every, but everybody does everybody get to be happy? Not a chance in hell. And 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 you know, and when you the anger that occurs, as is this song, the anger when you realize that life is shit, life's unfair. And the odds of you become the ambassador of France, the odds of, you know, Charlie Manson being here in a court, you know, and all uh, the, the odds of you getting a movie star to fall in love with you, who not well, never mind the fact that she's a child, you know, all of these things never going to happen. And, and I mean, it's literally musicalized. It's never going to happen, is it? Is it? No, sir. And 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 just we're done. We are absolutely done. Um, and... Yeah, and then the assassins make the balladeer disappear, and then he comes, and then Sarah flies her flag, and they have this lovely little triangle, and then up comes Leo Oswald. Um, lots of opinions differing on whether the balladeer becoming Oswald offers the stance that the voice of reason has decided to go with the ways of thinking of the assassins, which is ultimately the most negative concept this show could present. <laughs> um, a variety of different productions do it different ways. Um the recent on city encores did had an actor play Oswald, um, just as Oswald. Again, it's 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 kind of to be honest, it's what we're talking about when it comes to um, ensembling the show. What works better, the balladeer becoming Oswald, or having an actor just as Oswald, and just doing that one great scene, which is enough for some actors, you know, but a, in, a scene and a song at the very end of the show. It's about I the lim they want at least five songs. Oh, naturally. Yeah. <laughs> um, about no, don't get me started. Uh, the original idea was going to be have the opening be the set of the depository and have right. the whole thing be each assassin um convincing him. Convincing him. It was James Lapine who gave the idea hey. to have it be the ending and uh yeah, so, and I think it's well, James. Do you think? Yeah, I think it works ten times better as I know where you were sort of hesitant at calling it a twist or whatever, or sort of, but I do think it feels like a twist. And then, uh, sorry, we get this incredible scene. Uh, what a great, well-written scene with provo interesting, bizarre, and for me, this is where the Weidman concept of L the you know, the assassins being in one. And I just think there is something quite emotional about how they pitch it. And especially at the end, you know, we're your family, Lee, and I envy you, you know, with you, they will remember us. We are a unity and and, and, and that concept of history. I think it's a really, really exceptional 10 minute scene. Um, and the, and the, uh, the, will Booth now becoming a figure of all time? Like now he, He's starting to quote Death of a Salesman and talking about Willie Loam in a, a play from the 50s. And he's that concept now of, of, of all time. I, I How does that work for you? I really liked it. I love this scene. Brilliant. T tell me about it. Oh, I, I, can I just say I liked it? Yeah, you can do, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, but again, we don't lose any humor. You know, we have the, you know, he, he's brought curtain rods and he throws him, and, and now it's a gun. Sats already adjusted. And then, great moment, again, playing on the facts that they're all in the same space. You know, John, come over here. Where did where did Lee go to school? And who did he marry? And what did he do? And then, when 
when John Hink, when this man tries to kill the president of the United States, they will go to his room and they will find every book that's ever been written about you. And and he goes over, great button. Can I have your autograph? Great document, really works especially well. And because when you think about it, it is slightly it is a slightly bizarre thing that they're not chronological. I think it works because obviously JFK being the last successful one has a potent, potent potency and mm. importance that Hinckley doesn't like, there's no way that this show could be completely chronological and then yeah. end with the Hinckley attempt wouldn't work. What else have I got here? Um, and then, yeah, yeah, we get the, he gets the gun, aims it and bang. And then the lights, the bulbs, Flash and mm. then da, 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 da. but and it's heavy and thunderous. One thing that I don't know works for me is him standing there and the projection of the Zabruder film on his shirt. <laughs> Maybe a little bit on the nose, Joe. Don't know. Let's talk about something just broke. So, like I said, this wasn't in the original production. What did you think of this song? I've rated this number 10, even though I think it's beautiful and great. Yeah, no, it, it was fine. Um, I, yeah. Is it needed? This is the no. big question. Right, here no. we go. Yeah. So this was added in the 1992 London production. Um, and a lot of people have talked to, and it was the, and Sam Mendes, who directed that production, felt that a song was missing. And John Wideman sent Sondheim a video from the JFK Museum, and it was an entire video that was being sold of people's reactions. And he realised then that that was the song that was missing. And it's a beautiful song. I, I think the big point that I was reading about in some of the reviews is that in London, obviously, we have a completely different relationship to gun violence and also the shadow of JFK's death. And so in London, that is a song that like feels, um, what am I trying to say? In London, that is a song of showing us something that we don't exactly, that they didn't exactly experience and that they didn't exactly live through. Doing that song in America kind of feels like, yeah, you know, yeah, we remember. I've heard my dad talk about it. Also, <laughs> let's not, Forget why this reason, why this production was postponed. How can anybody listen to the song "Something's Just Broke" and not think of the towers have been hit instead of yeah. the president's been shot? And that is an overwhelming feeling. I mean, probably a million times more because the concept of shooting the president was something that was in everybody's minds. The concept of nine eleven was something wholly unknowable. Yeah. Uh. Sondheim and John says that it adds a dimension to the show. For us, the song is not only necessary, it is essential. And he notes himself that it has been criticised for, quote-unquote, adding warmth. Um, it's it, it, The argument can be made that it is like, you know, reminding the audience that this is bad and sort of like not patronising, but like, yeah, no, this is bad, guys. But I don't think that I don't know. I don't know anybody who's watching this going, yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know what? Well, yeah. You. <laughs> yeah, other than me, You're like, oh, yeah, Booth is a great role. <laughs> um, yeah, it, I, but bluntly, you said it, it. It's not needed. Do you? Do, could you make the argument for it, or how do you feel? Um, I mean, it works. Yeah. It but, is um, in the score now, un un unremovable. Sh it's not uh, one of those. It? Yeah, it's not um, optional. I mean, surely the, the reprise at the end does the job. Yes. I think that you could make the argument that having something just broke straight into the reprise actually makes the reprise darker. Whereas if you'd go... Oh. Well, the way it was done in the original production was... Lee shoots, turns around, they're all gone, shit, he runs off, and then projection flash of him being shot on TV, and then Vic, uh, Victor Garber comes back on, everybody's got the right. Um, I think both work. I think there's a bit more of a punch to shooting him straight into that. Something just broke feels like 
uh, you know, like a, a, a sort of lull, a lull song at the exact moment that you want to be going straight, straight to the yeah. finale. Um, and it's only three minutes long. I'm sure if it was longer, we'd say, what an incredible speed killer. Um, yeah. And then we get the reprise of Everybody's Got the Right. And Sondheim notes the legato in which the reprise should be played. This is him. And the show will end as I think it should, even though it ends on a gunshot, on a note of extreme sadness. Sadness for the people, sadness for the situation, sadness for any set of circumstances that invites or promotes the kind of horrifying acts that these people did. And I think it does do that. And you should have had more faith in your material because I because it does that anyway, um, without need of something just broke. Um, this was what they did at the Tony Awards, and they're doing the exact choreography and pointing the guns into the audience. And I just think the world's changed. I don't think on national TV on the Tony Awards, even though it is in the text of the show and it's what the show's about. I just don't think there's a world where 12 actors just point their guns straight into an audience anymore on, on American TV. You know what I mean? Really? I don't, I, just, I don't know. It just felt so bizarre to see. I don't know. In um, what way? I, I just, I, it just felt like I, would do, I don't think we'll ever see something like that again. Like the, Just the image of 12 people pointing their guns straight into yeah. the audience just felt... I mean, I'm sure in the context of a theatre, in the context of an hour 40 show is a completely different thing. But the idea of it being a 2000, you know, the Tony Awards, everybody's got the right to be. It's that sort of thing that's more dangerous when you talk about something just broke is just doing that song on its own. Now, I don't yeah. know what they would do at the Tony Awards because you're not going to do Ballad of Booth and scream the N-word. And, you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> I, I guess you could do. You could do Unworthy of Your Love. Uh, no, because we're actually, in actuality, the darkness of that being about a pedophile, <laughs> you know, I, I, it's incredibly prickly, thorny, controversial and dark material, no matter how you do it. And that's why it is so brilliant, of course. Um, any final thoughts, Will, on Assassins before we talk about best lyrics, other productions? Any final thoughts on this 2004 production? It was, it was good, good production. It was... Um, it was big, but still felt. I, I guess this is the biggest you could probably go with it. Um, but it still felt like it was quite a, an ensemble, uh, like a, yeah. a minimalist piece, which is quite nice. I've I hear a lot in a lot of these reviews that a lot of people um, are critical of productions of assassins that aren't intimate and aren't small, and that it works a lot better small and intimate, specifically the 2022 Chichester production, which we're going to talk about in a second. Yes, I've uh, I've seen seen that, uh, that trailer. Looks huge and big and and grand, and was criticised for it. Like, it lost a lot of its its, really? its intensity uh, in a lot of reviews cited. Anyway, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, Favourite lyrics? I've got four. Um, simple one. No one can be put in jail for their dreams. What an you know, you know, what an ingenious little you know. Obviously, they can when their dreams are to murder people. <laughs> you know. Um, but killers just get jeers and booze on visits to their grave. While Lincoln, who got mixed reviews because of you, John, now gets only raves. Very funny. Uh, another small one. Oh, we'd be left bereft of FDR. Very like yeah, that. Yeah, that's a, that's my sort of lyric. And uh, the Lord's my employer, and now he's my lawyer, so do as you dare. And also in the same song, but God was acquitted and Charlie committed until he should hang. Um, any other ones you noted down, Will, or was it... Uh, for, for me, it was, why, why did you do it, boy? Not just to destroy the pride and joy of Illinois. But all the USA. Oh, great, great stuff. Um, okay, then, let's move into production history. We talked about the stuff that surrounded... Um, the 2004 production. In 1992, Assassins opened in London at the Donmar Warehouse, and it was directed by Sam Mendes. And it had uh, it ran for 76 performances, closing in 1993. And it was Kieran Hines, well, as uh, Samuel Mick. Uh, which sounds interesting. Yes, I forget and... how many Spines siblings there are. No, Kieran Hines. All oh, right, <laughs> <laughs> that's a great I... joke. That's a great one. Oh, I don't Kieran know. Hines. Oh, wow. From Belfast. From Belfast, yes. Yeah. <laughs> As Samuel Bick, yeah. 
Oh, wow. Sam Mendes. What what else is Kieran? What is Kieran? I Hines? forget how long Sam Mendes has been kicking about. Well, Early is, 90s, directly. Yeah, no, d- d- it was the it was appointed artistic director of the Donmar Warehouse in 1990. Um before that, he made a big uh production of the Cherry Orchard with Judy Dench. Which is gonna get you, you know, gonna, yeah, gonna get you boost twice. your career forever. And then he, yeah, so it was at the Donmar Warehouse that he did Assassins, uh, and he did Cabaret, company. and yeah, that the company that we watched, yeah, company, Coke took company, Coke took company with. <gasps> Pardon me, is everybody uh, there? Because if everybody's there, um, and that's also when he did he the biggest one that he did, the big production was the one he, when he did the um huge Cameron Mackintosh Oliver with uh jonathan price Mm. uh which was very large um he also directed um oh the blue room with uh david hare uh starring nicole kidman i would is this sam mendes sam mendes yeah Um, he also also directed uh the motive and the cube he did will which is which we went and saw and was very good um and we saw leslie manville we did see leslie manville Oh, I should have said something to Leslie Manville. We saw Leslie Manville and we saw um Pedo Dad from Pedo Dad from Sardines. <laughs> <laughs> um we really should have uh said hello to Leslie Manville. I love Leslie Manville so very much. <laughs> um Mrs. Mrs. Paris, Mrs. Harris says so. <laughs> Mrs. Harris goes <laughs> Um, you know that there's like five of those books and they've been trying to get a remake, uh, a sequel going. I'll be there. We need it. We need it. <laughs> Mrs. Harris goes to Dubai. <laughs> I've always wanted to go to Dubai. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Harris goes to Bobner. <laughs> um, Paris comes to Mrs. Harris. What if all the lovely people she met in Paris come to the shitty East End place she lives? <laughs> Um, there was a 2012 reunion of the 2004 production uh, with Annalie Ashford as Squeaky. Yep. 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 Um, I, I think she's great. She is normally when she's playing American roles. Yeah. Terrible London accent. Now! <laughs> I've got a lot to tell you. <laughs> it's absolutely the worst thing I've ever heard in a long time. <laughs> um we should note here that the actor who played Charles Gash is a awful, awful criminal. I don't know why I mentioned any of this before. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and he wasn't charged yet in 2012, so he was still involved with the reunion. Um, they did a new production of Assassin's Will at the Many Air Chocolate Factory in 2014, directed by Jamie Lloyd. Jamie Lloyd, who is the new John Doyle. <laughs> he is... He is the he is I I am so and and if I'm in a production I I would love to, and Sunset was great for the most part and his betrayal was really? excellent yeah. for the most part, but I just feel like it's the Emperor's new clothes. Does nobody? There's no there's no sets or anything. It's just the same yeah. thing. Every I don't know. Um, star stood at Castwell. Catherine Tate as Sarah Jane Moore. Great. Oh, I have a question. Why are they all covered in blood at the end of the uh, Sunset Boulevard? Because he kills. Because she kills him. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Solomon, what a woman, what a part, innocent body, I'm a simple heart, and flaming as lust. I liked the car chase. I saw that on TikTok. Someone filmed all of the car chase. Yeah. <laughs> what Impressive. Do you think I- Impressive. Yeah. In a yeah. sense. In a sense. <laughs> um, and that had Andy Nyman as Charles Gateau. And uh, we had, uh, most importantly, the big deal was that it had... Mr. Sweeney Todd. Mr. Sweeney Todd himself, Aaron Tibet as John Wilkes Booth. <laughs> um, so Aaron just doesn't have an aged power to his voice. and It's it, the curse of being a tenor. It has the same, it just has the quality that's just, it doesn't do it for me. I'm sorry, for Booth. And I couldn't find a production with Danny Mac singing. Um, there's, I saw a version with the, um, with the, come back to me. 
Which are the ones I sent you? Oh no, sorry. I've realised Victor Garber is the architect of the Titanic. Yes, Thomas Andrews. Yes, Mr. Yeah, yeah. Andrews. Yeah, Mr. yeah. Andrews. Yeah, it's made of iron. Yeah, it's made of iron, sir. It will sink. I'm sorry, I couldn't build you a better ship, Rose. Well, come on, Lee. Um, the yeah. So this was, and and then it, this is interview with Aaron Tavet, and we really need to um, edit this clip and get him recast out of Sweeney. Uh, talking about his facial hair. Yeah, I went full racist. I went full Southern racist. I went for Leo in Django. Please, somebody just clip that and get him not cast in Sweeney. Get him cancelled so he can't do Sweeney. Just get... Because the interview was like, tell us about this hair. It's fabulous. It's really good. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I went full racist. I went full Southern racist. Please, just clip it. Please, make it a TikTok. <laughs> Please, somebody do it. <laughs> he then apologizes to his dad who can't grow a beard. I'm like, all right, just throwing your dad under the bus. Um, but so it's, it's his dad who deserves the apology. <laughs> <laughs> um, they did a production at the Nottingham Playhouse uh, with the balladeer switched to a female part. Uh, and then they added a bit at the end where the young child walks onto the stage from the audience, retrieves a gun from a vending machine. Um. All right. And they did a similar thing with the New York City Encores performance. That child who plays Sarah Jane Moore's child. Um, everybody's got the right. They point to the back of the audience. The child stumbles on and accidentally shoots. Really, really, really effective moment. Ooh. Yeah, really effective moment. And it makes the and it makes having a child on cast on staff <laughs> all is the it, is that, is that that's like a comment on the readily available. Oh, readily available one. guns, gun culture in the USA. The yeah. you know, chill, let's just say it's school shootings. Yeah. Uh, um, and that you failed course, to talk about the Sheffield Crucible version. There's a Sheffield Crucible version of Assassins. The Sheffield Crucible version of Assassins in 2006. Oh, okay. What happened there? Uh, starring Hadley Frazier. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, of of pirate queen fame. Um, no, Ian Hadley Frazier. You know, you know how of Hadley Frazier. He's yes. Lemis. Yeah, Raoul. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I make a lie to you. He's oh, he's great. He's he he's, is very good. Uh, he would be a very good. Yeah. Raoul is yeah. He well, he was he was Booth. He was Booth. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, who else was in this? Raoul. He he made me Raoul a dream role. I I would be a great Raoul. I'm gonna you would say be, it now. you you would be a great role. Um, if, Gerard Murphy. I think I didn't mention any of these because apart from Hadley Frazier, there was no notable oh, people. Rose in Doctor Who. Okay. Oh, here we go. If I give you the character name. In Doctor Who? Yeah. Um, oh, no. Okay. Uh, I'll talk about <laughs> this for a second. In 2020, I did a COVID production uh, as part of my... <laughs> and we did it all on Zoom and edited it all together. Uh, we had a black actor playing Booth, which worked in a sense because he was a very talented performer. Um, but I don't... I, we were then getting into, you know, is historical accuracy worthy? You know, is that... Does that muddy the waters? Does that muddy the point? Uh, they had a black actress playing Squeaky in the recent 2022 John Doll production. Color blind, can it color blind casting with historical performances? This is a lot more abstract than Hamilton. They do it in Hamilton. We're getting into all those sorts of conversations that people have all the time, and you can point to any argument that you want. <laughs> Take your pick. Um, Christopher Dickens, one of one of my teachers, just the absolute loveliest man in the world and he edited all of this together and it was wonderful um female balladeer um worked well uh but you did obviously lose the what Oswald shift Lee? yeah I, was it just a different person played Lee? we just had uh, the wonderful Tanner um doing yeah and he looked incredibly like Oswald as well which was bizarre <laughs> uh the funniest part is that I didn't they wanted to do the whole covid mask thing um, I didn't have a mask at that time because I hadn't left the house yet. And so I just used my huge scarf and I looked like a bit of hostage video. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the on-course production that they did, which eventually led into the 2022 John Doe production, 
uh, around the time of the very controversial and uh, production of Julius Caesar in the park, which had uh, Donald Trump and Malalia styled dressed costumes. So they were, they were very wary. Was, that, was everyone playing their own instruments? Not everybody. Not the child. Not the child. The balladeer was Ethan Slater, Ariana Grande, <laughs> SpongeBob. <laughs> oh, <laughs> speaking of which, um, I, I recently went to a wedding in Buckinghamshire. Ooh. We were driving around and I, I, I looked to my right to this huge field with a load of like uh, fencing, up, like big wooden fencing and loads of cranes. And I'm like, I recognise this. It was the Wicked set. Oh, wow. The, out, the big outdoor Wicked set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Field. I was like, that's that. Yeah, drove past it. Really fun. Yeah. I'm going to, right, let's play bets now. Good or bad? Um, Part one. Exactly. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Does that all need to be said? Well, this is, I, I dare say, part one could be incredible. And then part two could be dog shit. What if they what if part one doesn't end with defying gravity? It's got to. It's got to. But then what what is left for a whole film? Um you've got um, oh, I know, I know, Will, but not enough to bolster a whole film. It's barely enough to bolster an hour of theatre. You've got uh, as long as you're mine. Yeah, you've got for now. No, for good. For good. Great for story. now, for now, that's Avenue Q. Yeah. Uh, John Dole made a speech at the Encore's production talking about the state of life since they'd last stopped. They'd had the George Floyd um, killing and riots. They'd had the pandemic, more school shootings, and on a more minor aspect, obviously, Sondheim's own death. And so it was an incredibly uh, emotional and political production to put on at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, they did it. And, yeah, not everybody is actually doing their own... Um, the big thing is that was this huge, beautiful runway set, which was a flag. This the, so this is the version I most associate with Assassins. This is the version I know. Oh, right. um, the, the Traverse uh, yes. and Patrick Harris was in it. No. Was he, oh, was he not? Oh. No. I'm mixing no. things up, but that's that's what I associate. Is it's a great set. Running. And they have the ensemble in boiler suits, red, white, and blue boiler suits, which is a good, cool image gets funny during Unworthy of Your Love when one of them lays down with their clarinet in line with the bloody flag and is like... Doo -doo -doo -doo, and tries to be in line with the colours. Doesn't really work. Uh, they all have American flag COVID masks that they all take off and put around their sleeves. And it's like, oh, yeah, do you remember? Yeah, COVID. <laughs> Jesus. Um, John. And then at the end, uh, they have the projected January 6th insurrection footage. Interesting. John Doyle. If you feel for those people, what can you feel for those people who are planning to assassinate? And it happened during the production. Sondheim died during the production. I'm not going to be crude and say that it was some sort of cursed production, but it feels that way. Um, yeah. And then we have the 2023 Chichester production, which was not as well acclaimed in any way, shape or form, to be honest. Uh, Colorblind casting Mac. for Squeaky with Danny Mac. Astounding set, the whole debate mm. setting looks incredible. Game shows rather than carnivals. Uh, but apparently reviews just said it was really, really mismatched. And lots of ideas, and it didn't really mesh together. Um, but, and I thought that that was going to go in. I really did. And maybe it still will. But we haven't heard anything, we haven't seen anything. Huge production of assassins like that in the year that Sondheim's dead. You know, well, it's not anymore. It's been years now. But like, I would have expected that to go in, but it didn't. So we'll see. We're going to take our final break, and then we will be back to choose our songs and finalize what goes into the Sondheim canon. Bom bom bom. Do you think you'll be? Con How many songs will do you think we're going to put in? Um, six, five, five or six. Did you just say four? No, five. Okay. We'll uh, see how we we'll see what we do. Okay, and we're back, and we're here now to finalise uh, the. Uh, well, not finalise. That's a line. We've got passion to add, and we've got goodbye for now, and the boy from. 
uh, to add. But we'll do those uh, next week or whenever we do uh, the episode. Right. So, locks. Ballad of Booth. Yes. Lock. Unworthy of your love. Yeah. Lock. Everybody's got the right. Yeah. Are we doing opening or finale? I think we do opening. I agree. Opening, yeah. Which removes finale as a possibility. Which I've got rid of those. Okay. You're and it though I'm putting those in that order, I think. Do you agree? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Next, you have in your top five what's left. I've got gun song and another national anthem. Okay. I have Ballad of Guitar, then Battle of Cholgash. So we're losing something just broke. That's gone. We can lose How I Saved Roosevelt. We can... Uh, Gun Song, another national anthem, and then you choose your preferred of those two ballads. Ballad of Guitar or Ballad of Cholgash. Kato. Uh, oh, no, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Okay, right then. Okay, so Ballad of Booth, Unworthy of Your Love, Everybody's Got the Right, and then, and then I would say Gun Song? Gun Song. Gun Song, Ballad of Guitar, another national anthem. Or do you want it the other way around? No, that, that works for me. All right, okay. Ballad of Guitar. Now we go on to the actual ranking. How is that, is that entirely chronological? Ballad of Booth and with no, everybody's got the oh. rights in there and Gun Song. Yeah, no, no. Um, how high is Ballad of Booth going? So look, um, <laughs> is it cracking top twenty territory? Uh, it could be twenty. You know, let's go for it. I'm happy with that. Okay, so that is our new number 20. The ballad of Booth. Do we have a particular version of that that we'd like? The Probably the... Michael Severus. Michael Severus. Yeah. Okay. Unworthy of your love. Mm. <laughs> um... Is it better than Joanna Reprise? No. no. Where's Joanna? Where's Joanna? Repri Joanna Reprise is at forty-five. Yeah, this is what I'm thinking, Tom. Why is Joanna Reprise? <laughs> <there? laughs> What's going on? And worst pies in London above that final scene at seventy-eight. Uh, well, yeah, come on. Know. I'm happy with how the canon is looking. Okay. I'm even more happy that once we add these songs and once we add the songs from Passion, it may be an exact 100, which is something so satisfying. <laughs> I know. I, I know. <laughs> well, we're adding... Well, we're adding six songs. One, two, three, four, five, six, three, four. That means four songs from Passion. Yeah. <laughs> Or we could have another song from Sweeney Todd. That might be the case, because I don't know what four songs from... I think, well, I think Kiss Me. You do Kiss love Kiss Me. Me. All right, I'm going to put Kiss Me down here in bold, Will, for yeah. us to add for our finalisation. Okay? I sir, I miss. I sir, I miss. Okay. Um, unworthy of your love, then, down here with... Let's have it at New 46. Yeah. Yeah. I am unworthy of your love. Everybody's got the right at it's paired for me with Sunday in the Pout with George as a nice yeah. opening number. Everybody. Everybody's got the right. Uh gun song. Now we're in sort of 60 to 80 territory, I would say, for these final three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gun song. Mm -hmm. It's a better it's better than colour and light. Yeah. Good song. Everybody says don't. Let's have 
Ballad of Gato there. It's better than that. And then, how are we spelling Gato? <laughs> Gee, I've got the, I've got the, where is it? I've got it here. Gee. Oh, gosh, working man. G-U-I-T-E-A-U. -E now, that is one hell of a starting word for uh, Wordle. <laughs> I got, I'm getting better than my dad at Wordle, and he is. Are you, are you still doing the Wordle? I still do the Wordle, and I still do the movie grid. Oh, the movie grid. I still do the movie grid. What percentage were you on today, Will? I was in the top 2.2% of the world. Let me do it now. Oh, well, what, right. Uh, let's see if that's changed. Top 2.3. Mm, oh. Shit. Oh, it's changing. Um, and another national anthem, I would say, is not as good, is better than that. Is better than by the, is better than next, but not as good as by the sea. Although you don't like by the sea. <laughs> right. So with. Our new number 20 being the Ballad of Booth. Will, what is the top 20 in our Sondheim song canon? Number 20 is the Ballad of Booth. Number 19 is It Takes Two. 18, Sunday. 17, Everything is Coming Up Roses. 16, I'm Still Here. 15, Something's Coming. 14, Children Will Listen. 13, take me to the world. <laughs> oh, I'm getting married today. Need to change all this. Um, <laughs> let's just do this now. Getting married today at 17. Is it in the top 20? <laughs> what, and keep not a day goes by? No, put kiss me in the... Oh, Will, stop it. I uh, uh, Let's bump all of these up. Yeah. And put getting married today there. <laughs> Look at this. Live. Live. Um, number 10. Here we go. Number 10 is move on. Number nine, finishing the hats. Number eight is Rosa's turn, which is not Seven. actually a Sunday. <laughs> Seven, company. <laughs> Six is epiphany. Five, send in the clown. Four is losing my mind. Three, the ladies who lunch. Number two is being alive. One, a little, a little priest. priest. Very good. Uh, Will's going to do the movie grid, and then he's going to come to mine, and then we're going to have martinis and red wine. And... Oh, lovely. Oh, because they're all keto options. That's great. Um, Yeah. What's your Chinese? How, how, what's the keto option for having a nice Chinese? This is my uh, This is my thinking. I'm like, yeah, we're probably going to have Chinese. This is why I, I was I was too late suggesting Indian, because uh, because that's 100% keto. I'm just going to have to have a cheat day and have a big pile of uh, salt and pepper chicken, I think. Well, happy birthday to me. <laughs> <laughs> I think martinis, drunk inside number nine commentaries, red wine, and... Uh, I should have brought Blockbusters to the board game with me. I'm, I do apologise. You know what? You should apologise. Do we do a live recording of a movie quiz? I don't, I don't want to do any podcast stuff while I'm over. Well, where's the fun in that? It's, it's work, isn't it? I want to it's come fun. over for fun. Well, it's your birthday, isn't it? It is. This Who, is who's fun. In? Who's uh, in? Uh, everybody's in. Everybody's in. Well, my mum's, my, my sister's not in, my mum's not. Anyway, this is the end of our Assassin's podcast, one of the great musicals of the 21st century. <laughs> We're talking about Chinese. Um, Will, any final thoughts? Now that passion's left and were you're going to be like yeah that was good but like i'm never going to listen to that again um with passion probably i think well i'm we'll like see. that with assassins i think oh okay oh yeah right i didn't like it as much as i wanted to interesting yeah and let's leave this with uh in 20 words or less who do you think killed jfk tom <laughs> Lee was a patsy. Probably CIA, count that as a word. Grassy Knoll myth. 
<laughs> if Lee did it, meant to die at cinema, the cinema where they arrested him, got cold feet, but that's cold feet with a dash, so it's one word. Right. So you think it was an inside job? Was everyone? It, it was an inside job. Actually, wasn't it? I don't know. I've watched too many Oliver Stone documentaries about <laughs> who's still obsessed. He's still mad about JFK. Um, what about you, Will? What do you think? I th I I I like I I like to think it'd be a bit fun. would it if it was an inside job, not the obvious option. A bit fun. Um, yeah. There's the theory, Will Occam's Razor. Which means that the simplest solution is often the thing that really happened. But there's also such thing as a magic bullet. <laughs> <laughs> Back and to the left. Back and to the left. Right. Wonderful stuff. That was Assassins. We have Passion left. And then we have um, two episodes or one episode, depending on how things go, about celebrations of Sundown through the years. And... Is that Passion with... Um, uh, with... With Michael um, Cerberus. Ruthie. Ruthie was in it, yes. Ruthie was in it. There's two you can decide now, Will. Because you probably won't have time or the patience to watch both. There's two different filmed full productions of Passion. There is the original Broadway cast with Donna Murphy, which is probably the one that we should watch because it's the original. And then there's one with Audra McDonald, Michael Cerberus, and Patty Lapone. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> it's the final product. It's the final collaboration yeah, of him and watch the uh, the original. It's the final production of him and James Lapine as well. Ah, oh. uh, yeah. Watch. Well, watch the original, and then you can actually flick through the Michael Service, whatever. Yeah. Anyway, uh, passion, and then celebrations of Sundime, and then this Sundime series is complete. Your Bye. death. Goodbye. <laughs> so long. Bye. Da -ba -da -ba -da -da. Ba 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 ba